So it's my very great pleasure this afternoon to share with you homeopathy um, as medicine of the past and medicine of the future. And in so doing, I'll be looking very much, yes, at the water medicine of the Solomon Islands, which is a project that I, did, I became involved with back in 2009, shortly after arriving here. But it's an amazing legacy of over 100 years of homeopathic prescribing for both acute and chronic disease across the islands of the Solomons by 150 village pastors who have managed to do this with very little training um, and very little support. And I guess in so doing, I will also be... Can we have the new slide? Um, not just touching on the, the project as medicine by numbers, but also looking at other international projects. And I know we're running rather late and over this afternoon, so we may have time to share during the course of the week what's going on in your own communities and in other places internationally. Um, and I may share a clip with you as well from Carol Boyce's C CD, um, Homeopathy Around the World. Has anybody seen that? Yeah. There are a mark of lot, yeah. I've got a short clip on the Solomons, but there is this available for those of you who haven't seen it. You're welcome to borrow it. Um, she's made a fantastic documentary of the many uh, projects that have taken place. So, um, Nahima mentioned the Friends of Chernobyl's Children Project. That was really a project I cut my teeth on, uh, working with children post-Chernobyl, um, who we brought across to the UK for a month, every year for five years. So that meant we had a chance to really make a significant difference with homeopathic medicine in their lives, as well as in seeing regular doctors, dentists, opticians. We had 20 other control groups in the UK with which to compare their vitality, their immunity, their growth charts, their weight gain. And in every instance, we exceeded every other group of children during those five years. The project continues. It's now in its 16th year. And the little boy we bought, age seven, called Vanya, has just had it celebrated literally a week ago, his 21st birthday. Um, and it, a great testimony now with our Facebook to be able to link up with these children as young adults. So last year, I had the privilege to attend a series of lectures um, on global healthcare issues as part of the G20 build-up in Brisbane. We had international health professionals, researchers, and, and medical um, practitioners from across the globe looking at some of the issues that we're now facing. Also, um, addressing... I guess in, in many areas, how we can improve permaculture, how we can improve healthcare education, uh, looking at irrigation in cities, living city apartments. One chap from China presented the concept of actually having a living wall in your living room, breathe it, you know, with plants, um, and the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and just some really fascinating projects. Also, looking at the huge increases in obesity and diabetes and the impact that that is had, having on the healthcare burden. The thing that wasn't represented, which really upset me, obviously, was homeopathic medicine. Uh, and I didn't get the chance to really raise that at that point, but I have had contact with the Brisbane Marketing Group who posted that. And should any event like that come again to do with healthcare, um, I'll be looking for some of you to come and speak um, about the global things that you're involved with and how we see it. So, Homeopathy's opportunity, I believe, is huge to help meet some of these future challenges. And you're all here from different parts of the world with a huge range of wonderful experience. Some of us are newer to homeopathy, some of us have been in practice a long time. All that is irrelevant. We're a global community, and together our collective consciousness and energy, I believe, can move mountains and change the world. And if 150 village pastors with very little training can prescribe accurately and effectively and treat acute and cr chronic disease for over a hundred years, well, what, what else can we achieve? We've been educated, we have the tools and skills to really take our medicine much, much further afield. Don't we? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Right. I know it's late in the afternoon. I don't know if you want to stand up, turn around, move. Um, I have music from the Solomons for later. <laughs> okay. So, how did homeopathy come to the Solomon Islands, I guess you'll be asking yourself. Well, it was a group of passionate and, and individually driven people that arrived in the Solomons as Christian missionaries, having had a couple of months training at the London Bible College and then um, 
a month or two at the London Homeopathic Hospital, which had a special division set up called Med Medical Services Mission. And then they were dispatched to the far-flung Commonwealth bits, the pink bits of the globe, with a box of remedies in one hand, the Bible in the other, to preach and heal. Could I have the next slide? So this is a picture of the Missionary School of Medicine, which was actually established by the British um, Homeopathic Association, which is the faculty of medical doctors in the UK. And it was established with the sole purpose of training lay missionaries to go out to be able to support their own health, that of their families, and those of the communities that they were visiting, and also to start dispensaries, um, and, and obviously to support the local communities. What actually happened, or what, what is recorded, and I've got some interesting books here if you want to know more, um, this book, Touching Ends, Ends of the Earth, records many of the early missionaries' work, and a lot of them ended up doing minor operations, cataract surgery and other surgery, because quite frankly there wasn't anyone else available. Um, so they learned to do these things and were trained here at the Missionary School of Medicine. The faculty were very careful though, they made everyone sign particular documents saying that they would never claim to be a doctor and they would never practice in the UK. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's entertaining looking back at the, the documentation that they had to sign. So housed within the, the, the mission, uh, within the London Homeopathic Hospital up until the 1920s when it moved to Powers Place, and then it remained as a teaching facility for missionaries and also medical doctors in homeopathic medicine up until 1996 um, when it closed for teaching and it became a trust. Um, it closed a teaching facility for uh, missionaries and now it's a trust fund providing funding for medical um, projects over, uh, overseas. And they're interested in the Solomons, but I would have to be a qualified doctor to be able to apply for a grant. So we've got the medical nurse there putting in an application for funding for specific projects. Today they're involved in, in, in many projects around the world. The next slide, please. So who knows where the Solomons are? Yeah, now, now you do. Maybe that was a little premature. Uh, anyway, as you can see, it's situated east of Papua New Guinea, northeast of the most northerly point of Australia, and just below the equator. It's a series of nine volcanic islands, um, over 900 miles long, and surrounded by beautiful coral seas. The biodiversity of the Solomons is absolutely outstanding. If any of you are interested in diving, um, and indeed, you know, what's available within the Amazon areas there in, in the tropical rainforests, I thoroughly recommend visiting. It's not set up for tourists. Uh, we had to wade through mud. We went paddling canoes to reach some of the inner communities of these islands. And you don't go with digital project projectors and computers because, of course, there's no lighting, there's no electricity. You're actually, it's chalk and talk, and it's acting out the remedies because many of them can't even read. Um, but we are addressing that as part of the challenge moving forward. So, uh, interestingly, out of the 500,000, about 80,000 are estimated to use homeopathy. So any of you good at maths, it's around 15%, which is quite a large percentage of the community. Um, and yeah, the Amazon of the sea. Next slide, please, thanks. So who? We know where um, and we know how, but who took this medicine first to the Solomon Islands? It was a John Northcote Deck. He was born in the UK, did his medical training in Australia, in Sydney, and spent some time at the Melbourne Homeopathic Hospital uh, before embarking and setting out to the Solomon Islands, which at that stage was known for its uncivilization and its cannibalism. You can imagine Victorian um, families, because the wives went as well, in their beautiful sort of boned corsets and boots, arriving on an island to be greeted by half-naked people with sort of, you know, masks and all the warrior spears. But anyway, they went. He was a fearless um, explorer um, and spent 20 years at, uh, at South Seas Evangelical Mission. One of the most significant things that he did was to establish a dispensary and a hospital on the island. The hospital on the island now is not purely homeopathic, but the chief head pharmacist there has attended all of our training workshops. 
and he wants his medical staff trained in homeopathy for first aid and, and also as, as we move forward in more chronic disease because their facilities are so limited, really just all, all minor operations. So this is John Northcote Deck. His father actually established the homeopathic hospital in Ashfield, I think, in Sydney. It doesn't exist now, but, but that was his father's on it. The next slide, thanks. So um, he was the medical doctor, he was the preacher, the engineer, the photographer. He was one of the first, well, he was the first uh, white person to cross from Malaita to, um, from west to east. Um, shame I haven't got the map here, but um, anyway. It's quite a distance, and it would have been completely unexplored prior. Uh, he was honoured by the uh, Geographical Society and made a fellow of that association. And the most significant thing that he did was to take a box of 36 remedies. And it was this 36 remedies um, which he used to treat the conditions that he met there, many of which he would not have encountered in Europe. Tropical diseases, um, Malaria, dengue, um, and there's a huge list. And there's a little booklet called Homeopathy for Tropical Diseases, which was compiled by the Tropical Disease Centre of London and Liverpool. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen this. It's out of print now, but it's a fantastic reference guide for anyone working in tropical areas. So if you can find one in a second-hand bookshop, um, this is definitely something to, um, to acquire. So, the remedies in the box look like this. Next slide. Um, this is a photograph of the original box of 36 remedies. Um, the photographs, all of these photographs come from uh, a chap called Gordon Griffiths, who is the great nephew of North Cape, Northcote Deck. And, uh, he's an ex-teacher, a great historian, and has archived huge amounts of material and photography of the... Um, and details of the homeopathic prescribing in the Solomons. And you can see here Northcote deck dispensing and actually teaching the, 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 the local people. And next, next slide, thank you. So what's in the box? Well, if you're very, very anxious, you might get number five, which is Arsenica Malvin. It could be number three, or it could be number 47. The dispensers were never told what the remedy was, until we arrived. <laughs> they just knew them by numbers. So a woman in labour might need number 23. Colophonin, slippery birth, facilitates easy delivery. That's how they learn it. It's number 23. If you've got short wind, or a bit of asthma, um, breathlessness, you might need number one. That's Antarct. Or of course it could be, if you're really anxious with your asthma, it could be number five, and that's our Seneca album. But it might be number 25. And we went really to find out how they were differentiating and, and how they were using these medicines. But lovely terminology, it's the belly run and the belly shut. Um, so, remember those numbers, you will be tested later. There's a few little short cases, just to make sure we're all awake, because I know it's been a long day and some of you have travelled half halfway around the world. Next, thank you. So, a quick zip through the SSEC timeline. Following um, Northcote Deck came his son, Ken Griffiths and Margaret. Um, Ken and Margaret were in the Solomons for around 20 years. Ken Griffiths um, distributed a further 100 boxes of remedies. Um, so there were now 150 dis dispensed around the islands. He was followed by Sister Schrader, who was a German nurse. And she wrote in her diary, something rather interesting if I can remember, which I can't, um, what did she write? Oh, I do need glasses, don't I? I was fortunate that homeopathy came into my hand early in my missionary experience. Northcote Deck had introduced 36 homeopathic <coughs> medicines, which he thought would need, meet the needs of the people there. And we treated diseases like malaria, blackwater fever, tick bites, that we've had no experience of in Europe. Um, and she also refers to one of her key references being the homeopathy for tropical diseases by Edwin, Edwin Leadby. She was followed by Margaret Bartlett. Um, Margaret was there for over 20 years in the Solomons. Um, she extended uh, the remedies to the 52 and wrote a handbook. And these are more of my exhibits, which you can come and have a look at later. Um, and the handbag, handbook really was to help, um, help the dispensers understand 
more about the medicines, what they were useful for, and how to differentiate. So she started to talk about modalities, things that were better for and worse from. And working very much with the principle of the three-legged stool, if you've got three core symptoms, then you can make a, a solid prescription. Um, and then after her, um, Gordon Griffiths went down with Dr. John Allen Clark. Could you click again, because the words are missing, um, but that's okay. Yeah. So that's a quick run-through of, of the timeline of the people that were there. So the last um, individuals there were there in 1993. We can fast forward to 2009, and I arrived in Australia, and one always wonders how you get involved in these things. You're settling in a new country, you're trying to set up a practice, your husband's setting up a business, your eldest son really doesn't want to be in Australia, so there's lots of issues there. And then you get this email asking for help in the Solomon Islands, and I'm thinking, uh, so I passed it to all the pharmacies and to a number of homeopaths I knew had been in practice a long time. And this email somehow just kept coming back into my inbox. And I thought, well, I'd better do something. So I made a phone call. I contacted Ken Griffiths, the treasurer, who, whose opinion was that it was something to do with witchcraft or um, medicine that really black magic shouldn't be allowed. And I tried to reassure him that actually it was perfectly OK. Um, anyway, next slide. Where are we up to? So yes, Edwin Neatby's tropical diseases, this is a summary of some of the things they'd encounter and they would treat routinely from the book with the options that they had on remedies and the, and the real bare bones of differentiation as to what to give. And then the next slide. I'll move quite quickly through because most of this is in the handout. This is a copy of the remedies. You have 30 seconds to memorise 1 to 51. How are you doing? Okay, next slide. <laughs> So we arrived in Honiara, having had several discussions with, with the treasurer of SSEC um, and agreeing three specific, specific objectives. And the first was that we should visit as many dispensary areas as we could in the two and a half weeks that we were to be there, to meet the dispensers, to find out how they were um, prescribing, um, to look at their cases, to record some of these cases, because nothing had been written down. Um, and then to look at ways of actually um, supporting them, whether that would be through training and development or updating remedies, bringing in additional remedies, etc. This picture is of Joy. Joy has been dispensing in Honiara, which is the capital of the Solomons, for some 25 years. She does use the handbook, um, and she seemed to be using that very effectively. We sat in um, her dispensary, and she was treating anything between 75 and 100 patients a day. And the way she'd record them would be on a chalk tally board. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And so we asked her, you know, uh, do some of these people come back with the same complaints? Oh, yes, yes, that happens. I said, so what do you do? Oh, I give them the same remedy or I see what the symptoms are. I said, so how useful would it be to be able to think, well, if they're coming time and time again, maybe there's a deeper remedy or a different remedy that we can give to clear this. Oh, that would be great, she said. So clearly there is a need for record keeping, and that was one of the first things that we, we tried to, to, to address whilst we were there. Next slide. This is Florence um, with her granddaughter. I'm just going to flick through a few very quick um, cases. If you click again, we might get a snapshot of what was wrong with Florence. Um, Yes, we uh, just click, yeah. She had boils on the head since vaccination. Um, we might consider things like fear, but they didn't have fear in the Solomons at that point, they have now. But remedy number 10 was given based on these symptoms uh, that Joy had identified. And number 10, you'll all remember. Uh, cow calf, thank you. Great, okay. Next, next slide. This is Beth Philoa, one of the eldest um, dispensers. She was 89, she's still going, she's now 95, I think. Um, she operates from her home on a Saturday afternoon and might see between 15 and 50 patients. And this was one of the, if you can click again, one of the cases that she gave us. She really likes remedy number four. Thank you. Excellent. So you get the hang of this. How many of them die numbers? It's so simple. Everybody should be able to do it. Next slide. Ah. So, we went across to uh, Malaysia, 
And this was our consulting room in Ambu, not bad, hey? I mean, I think I'm spoilt in Brisbane looking out onto, you know, rain, rainforest um, but, um, and bush. But here, this was something really special. If you can click again. Uh, and this is Robin, my colleague. Robin Gaze, um is a nurse, or was a nurse, as well as a hemiopath. And interestingly, she treats predominantly animals, specifically horses. Um, but she does treat humans as well. Um, and we went together, um, to get, and she brought her husband and her son with, with her, which was just as well because the procurement of food was quite difficult. So the men went out hunting and gathering for us and prepared the meals in the evening at the church transit. Um, yeah, and one night we nearly had roasted rats that had ended up in the oven, but that's another story. Uh, if we can click again. So this was a case that it wasn't one that Robin had taken, it was one that a dispenser, but very common pictures, ear infections, delayed dentition, and here we have it again, one of the basic remedies for childhood, um, number 10, cup carb. Next, next slide. Um, this was an interesting case, baby Karen, yes, ouch, ooh, pussy, smelly, um, if we click again, eruptions, foul smelling, Pus scabs. No, looking at your notes. You're supposed to be able to do this. You're all experienced homeopaths. Hang on. Yes, we, we gave pyrogen and it worked. It was given again and it worked, but it kept coming back. So what did you give next? Silica. Sulfur. Sulfur or silica would have been good, but no. Pardon? All good remedies for infection, <laughs> but we gave Staphylococcus, and that clearly yeah, is a staph infection. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But pyrogen. No, 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 no. That was something we sent over after because the case came back to us, um, and we said, right, okay, the indications now are that it's it's a staph infection, as is often the case with um, school sores and things like that. Um, next slide. So, children in the Ambu village, we went in and did some basic teaching of head, shoulders, knees, and toes, and little songs and things, and they loved that. Yes. It's not, not very, well, it's not necessarily heavy happy, but it's fun. Um, so, teething case, whiny, irritable. Camomilla. So, there we have it, number 16. You see, we could all just prescribe by numbers, couldn't we? And we could teach our fellow communities to do the same. And the next one? Who have we got next? Oh yes, this is an interesting case. Um, child um, number one at the front had had really bad um, nosebleed since the snake bite, and yes, I can hear the words lachesis, number 46, cleared it up completely, wound healed, everything healed. Next remedy, or next picture. Kirsty is the girl in the red shirt. Uh, she's a really special girl. Um, she was born with a patent ductus, um, so that had to be operated on when she was about 12 months old. It had started to reopen and she was becoming symptomatic. Um, and the problem was that the, they, they'd been able to scan and they knew they needed an operation, but there is no facility and there are no heart surgeons in the Solomons. They rely on a ship, the heart ship that comes around every four years. She, her prognosis was she would not last. Um, they'd been giving phosphorus. She was a very lively, creative uh, child. There were respiratory issues. She even started, um, her, her cousins and her were great singers. They sang to us for an hour whilst we talked to her mother about the case. Um, and they produced a, a DVD, to, or CD, I should say, to try and raise funds for an operation. Now, you can imagine, um, it would take probably even 50 years, you wouldn't raise enough money in the Solomons to, to pay for that sort of operation. Uh, patent ductus, it's, um, who can explain this medically quickly? It's an opening in the heart, one of the valves, and then at birth it normally closes, but it didn't, so it had to be operated on. And in some individuals it reopens. Um, so major, major heart operation. And talk about synchronicity, about two months later, I find myself in the UK um, for a seminar with Elise, and I go and see some friends in um, South Wales, where I used to live, and I'm talking to Christine, and I'm saying, Christine, this child is just on my mind. We can't get an operation. We've contacted the Solomon's Consulate. Robin's been in touch with the paediatricians that she used to work with, and nobody will do an operation. What do I do? 
She said, oh, don't, don't you remember, my daughter Jo, she's a paediatric heart um, nurse in Sydney. Why don't we ring her? And we did. She spoke to her, her bosses, and one of them said, yeah, I can do pro bono. That's no problem at all. And they arranged with the Rotary and with the consulate to have this operation paid for. And the daughter came, well, she came and the mother came, um, and the operation took place about three months later. It did have to be repeated. The first operation was not successful, but this is now five years on, and she's well, she's in high school, she wants to study medicine, and she wants to be a homeopath. <laughs> yeah, this is great. So if we can click again, that would be fabulous. Uh, yeah, number 29, well, I've already told you the answer to, to, to what that is. Um, yeah, phosphorus. So next, next slide, thank you. So our objectives um, in going there were to identify really whether the remedies they were using were still effective. To top up, they have three master remedy kits, one in Honiara, one in um, Malata, and one in um, Rena. And the master kits are, if you like, the medicating potencies that are used to medicate all the other kits. And a lot of them were half empty and needed topping up. So we were able to address that at a practical level. They also dispense um, in water, so they, they need bottles. And sadly, they do use plastic bottles because glass just gets broken and there were too many accidents. Accidents in the Solomons are rife. There's very little health and safety. You know, people are falling out of trees, smashing cars, all kinds of things happen. And the glass, they decided they'd just use plastic um, when that came into being. So we, we use the, the small, almost like... Um, yeah, they're just plastic bottles, but they can, they can measure their dose with the dropper. So the training we set up was to address the obvious need to help them identify and differentiate their remedies better and to become more familiar with what the remedies are. And so we ran a series of workshops in 2011 and 2012. Annie Sam is the uh, homeopathic and medical coordinator at South Seas Evangelical Church. And... Um, our aim was to get Annie self-sufficient in running training for herself. It wasn't just about the homeopathy, though. Basic things in countries like this, like hygiene, washing hands, uh, good diet, good food, nutrition, are all also equally important. And those things were part of it, as well as showing them how to take temperatures, blood pressure, um, and the importance of exercise. Obesity is becoming quite an issue there. A lot of sugar is eaten. Um, and huge sweet tooth and so there is diabetes more now and in the last uh, 10 years, and certainly the last 5 years we've seen a huge in increase in what I would classify as vaccine related illnesses um, and sadly that's, that's a sign of the times um, so here we see at the end two dispensers proudly displaying their certificates um, each course was a week long um, and um, yeah, I mean, we went through an awful lot. We used um, a guide called a pictorial guide to remedies, which I don't have here with me, uh, by Vivian Lawnsley and someone Scott in the UK. And we gained permission from them if we had, if we bought 50, to photocopy another 100. So every dispenser had a copy of this pictorial guide, which helped differentiate, you know, with certain headaches where the pain was, where the heat is with throats, whether it's right or left sided, etc. And they found those really, really useful. The other book we used, um, Dr. Anita Davis is part of the MSN in London, and I had contact with her from a historical perspective. And she provided us with 150 depocords, which you may have heard of. These were standard um, issued to missionaries and were developed at the time of, well, around the 1920s by students as a quick reference to help learn their remedies. They're not really a materia medica, but they're very useful in terms of quick reference of better for, worse than, uh, likes and dislikes and preferences, etc. So this is another useful book, and a lot of homeopaths I know seem to have one in their, in their toilets in a small room for reading. Mainly students, actually, that I, I've taught. But um, that's there to look at if you're interested. So that was 2011 and 2012. Can we have the next slide? I've lost my slide, man. Um, so in 2013 and 2014, Annie Sam coordinated... Thank you. Um, Annie Sam coordinated another series of workshops, both in Honiara and, and on the islands. We did a one-week course on, in the inner 
echelons of, of Malaita. And it was so exhausting getting there. We, we flew to Honiara. We then flew to the island. We then literally had the canoes for two hours. And then we walked an hour and a half to this little um, village where they'd been baking food in the ground all day for our arrival and welcomed us with open arms and great ceremony and ritual. Um, and they're really people of great faith. Um, and in the, such remote areas where there is so little, the fact that they, you know, they survive so well and they've been able to look after their health has been really, really important. So Ami Sam continued the training that we started, um, continued the basic medical training and hygiene, but most importantly now we're, we're also uh, bringing into the fold community health workers and women's health workers, and these will be going out to rural villages. So as the village pastors become too old to dispense or too old to work, there will be someone new identified within those villages to take on the role of dispenser, and they won't have to be the village pastor, um, historically that's been the case, but now we're looking for anybody that is literate and that can learn and that has an interest in, in actually helping take this forward. Um, I've mentioned the Deca Cords and Pictorial Guide to homeopathy, and the certificates they found really special and they're all very proud of their, their certificates. So that was 2013-2014 and the course is finished at the end of March and then what happened? Anybody remember what happened in March 2014 in the Solomon Islands? Yeah, and more than that, if we can have the next slide, thank you. Um, there was, in fact, flooding, and click again, um, heavy flooding at the beginning of April, and then they had a series of earthquakes. And I, it was absolutely disastrous. Uh, Annie Sam managed to get messages to us through texts and emails before all the communication lines went down. Um, the flooding, the displacement of people. In Honiara alone, there are around a thousand people just displaced and homeless. The emergency centers were set up to deal with the flooding, and then the earthquakes came, and you can imagine what that caused. And of course, post that, with lots of water lying around, you're looking at malaria, you're looking at dengue, you're looking at diarrhea and vomiting and other, other things happening. Um, so it, it really, when an island like that has, well, we've seen it in the Philippines, I guess it may have happened here in Indonesia, it takes an awful long time to recover. But the dispensers were really proud that they could go in with remedies for anxiety and for grief and loss of personal things. Um, and loss of people, of course, because many, many people died. Around 500 in Honiara, and I think the total toll was two or 3,000, which out of a population of 80,000 is, is fairly significant. Um, so that was 2014, and the next slide, we were approached to ask to help prevent um, the outbreak of dengue fever. And I called upon the resources of Dr. Anna Teresa Doria Bru, who I think about five or six years previously had been asked to produce a prophylaxis. We did send in the nose over, but we also provided um, information on how to make these up because they had these remedies there. And, and it was quicker and easier for them to do this for themselves. And thankfully, very few people contracted dengue fever. They got this out really, really quickly. So again, that shows the wonder of prophylaxis and, and just the potential and po possibility of our medicine. Um, and yeah, the rest, I mean, that speaks to itself. That is in your handout. I had that slide printed out for you. And the whole presentation is available if, if, if you want it, obviously. So, so next, next slide. So, sort of in, in, in summary, um, there are many challenges, many opportunities. Um, and we may as well have the next bit as well. Um, time, so I'm having to... Very good. We're all right at the moment. Good. Okay. <laughs> I'm rattling through. Um, and again. Thanks. And these things really speak for themselves. I mean, the, the, the major thing is that 150 village pastors over 85, um, they may live to 105, but we actually have to get more people on the ground, trained up. Um, and aware of homeopathy, but more importantly, being able to identify the right remedies uh, quickly and efficiently. And we're doing a lot more material medical work and sort of pump the rubric and helping them to repertorize. A couple, there's two or three that have been educated actually to university level and are really keen in taking their studies further. So we're looking at long distance training, hooking up with Misha Norland's college um, because they do some long distance foundation work, which I know Misha, so that was easy for me to access. Um, 
The locations of the islands really are so difficult to get to and so remote, um, but we know the training has to take place there. But set, trying to set up more regional centres so that more of the dispensers can gather once a year or twice a year in one location, so it's efficient use of time and resources, um, obvious things. Some of the threats that we see and, and issues of the potential regulation of homeopathy, I just dread to think if um, the regulatory boards go in and decide that, yes, it has to be regulated, what will happen? Um, so we don't even think about that because we don't want to attract it. Um, we just don't want to know. The fact the head, um, head pharmacist at the hospital is so interested and supportive of homeopathy is brilliant. He has very few medicines to work with um, postoperatively. The hospital's great for, um, yeah, for surgery and for broken bones and things like that. But once people leave to prevent infection, he sends them straight down to Joy. And Joy is literally you know, 100 yards down the road. And that's where they go. So they've worked quite in an integrated way together for a long time. There will be more environmental disasters. They're on that Pacific Rim. Um, you know, how do we prepare for those? How do we make sure that they have prophylaxis kits at the ready instantly to distribute as and when and if these things happen? And it, creating the awareness. And yeah, vaccines, well, um, we've started that subject and that will continue, I'm sure, throughout the week as to what damage that is doing um, at, a, at a huge level in terms of the overall immunity, but also in terms of chronic disease. I know in, in the UK we were seeing um, more and more measles and outbreaks of mumps in young men because the regular routine vaccinations wore off and then they're contracting childhood diseases in their 20s. And of course they're more serious and they're more threatening um, and harder to, 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 to get through, as well as autoimmune diseases in younger and younger people. So, next slide, what are we up to now? Ah, oh, a quick clip, three minutes, Carol Voices DVD. Let's see if it works, and if not, we've got it on a memory stick, I think. You should be able to press. So get up and go. Thank you! I have a problem. Mm -hmm. Published his urban art medicine in 1810. Homeopathy's history has been filled with individuals taking homeopathy back to their homelands or to remote areas of the world, inspired by results they have witnessed or cured of conditions for which they could find no other relief. In the process, homeopathy is spread, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but always steadily. Right here and right now, the same process continues. There are projects run by structured organizations, others organically put together by small groups of like-minded colleagues, still others created and sustained by a single driven individual determined to make a difference. Some projects are purely educational, some clinical training programs, others include nutrition. All are integrated into the fabric of the society, working with local groups, local councils, local chieftains, and government officials all recognize the need to build a self-sustaining future. In the last two decades, a powerful new movement has answered the call of natural disasters and taken homeopathy to places like Africa to address the most pressing issues of our time. These homeopaths are the unsung heroes of our community, and this film is just a snapshot of a few of the incredible projects working hard out there in the field. Homeopathy, or the water medicine, was introduced to the Solomon Islands in the 1920s by Dr. Northcote Deck, a medical missionary from Britain via Australia. For 19 years he sailed among the islands in his boat, the Evangel, as captain, engineer, photographer, explorer and doctor. He taught a group, the dispensers, to prescribe 36 homeopathic remedies by numbers. In the 1970s and 80s, Margaret Bartlett, another missionary, added another 15 remedies to their list. From those small beginnings, over 150 dispensers across six regions now treat an estimated 60,000 people a year for a wide range of accidents and emergencies as well as acute and chronic disease. Joy, on Yara's main dispenser for more than 25 years, sees up to 60 people a day 80-year-old Beth Filoa, one of the oldest dispensers and Joy's teacher, still runs a Saturday acute clinic from her home. Belly Ron, or diarrhea, 
might need number 42, Aconite, number 3, Argentum Nitricum, or number 5, Arsenicum Album. Belly shot or constipation might need number 9, Bryonia, number 10, Calcarea Carbonica, or number 16, Chamomilla. The water medicine is being prescribed simply, accurately, and classically to great effect. Jane Lindsay and Robin Guzzi, homeopaths from Australia, are looking at the possibility of further training for the dispensers and renewing their supplies. So yes, that's a snapshot of Carol Boyce's um, DVD, which I thoroughly recommend to you. I've got a copy here, so if anyone wants to view it whilst you're here over lunchtime or whatever, just, just let me know, just ask. Um, she produced that really to increase awareness. Can you just go back one? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, to, to increase awareness of the many wonderful projects that are taking place. Um, and also as a tribute to her late father who passed, but as a way also to raise money and fundraise for each of these projects. And Solomon's have received some money and that's been put to a very good use for some of the dispensing bottles that they need, which would ship out from all, uh, Australia. So at this point, I will check how much time we have, because I was considering sitting into a couple of groups to quickly buzz out some of the challenges in global healthcare. Really, the, the G20 health forums really inspired me to, to, to start to think, well, you know, what is our responsibility as homeopaths? Or each and every one of us has been involved with our own communities, um, some of us locally, some internationally. But what more can we be doing? And I thought it might be useful to spend just five, ten minutes thinking about some of the challenges that are happening in healthcare, and then for us to consider, well, how can we meet those, and what more might we be doing individually and collectively to make that difference? If 150 village pastors can achieve um, this history, historical um, treatment of people for all this length of time, what more can we do? Do we want to split into groups, or are we kind of hurried to get to dinner, or what do we want to do? Well, can we do it as one group? One group. Well, yeah, let's do it as one group then, yeah. yeah. I just thought two groups and there could feedback, but one group would be easier then. So, okay, do you want to describe, and we can just put it on the wall, or? or... Oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. So, let's open it to the floor. What, what are some of the um, challenges that we see in, in healthcare? And don't look at your hand up, because those are some of my ideas. <laughs> Vaccines. Yeah? yeah? Great. So I went to India a few years ago and did a month long um, clinical work going out, walking out to villages around India in around Makabara, which is on the way to Dajima, and um, saw all sorts of diseases that I've never seen in New Zealand. And I came back from that and I thought, you know, it's just wonderful to be exotic and go to these places. But really, my biggest audience is down the road in Flaxmere. And I need to be working with those people more than travelling around the world anymore. And so um, that, James, just inspiring me <laughs> to put some will behind that thought because um, I have worked there already and then I've taken a bit of a holiday from it, but I'm, that's my inspiration, is to go back and work with the Māori people in Flaxmere. Great. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that critique did have a freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. Absolutely. And, and the power that Big Pharma have in this you know, And the money. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen in Australia Obviously, the report, the NHMRC report back, despite the fact that in the UK, the Science and Technology Committee in the House of Commons agreed there should be freedom of choice, homeopathy should continue, but there should be more research. Here, they completely ignore all of that. Um, GMO. GMO. Yeah. 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 Slash corporate farming. Yeah. Slash Rhonda. It's the, inte the integrity of our food supply. And, and, and encouraging permaculture and some of the things that, that came up. Yeah, that's really important. Large displaced populations. Huge displaced populations, I would say. And yes, I look forward to speaking to you more about the work that you're doing in, in, in that part of the world. Part of, part of it for me also is about standing with the united voice within yeah. homeopathy, but also as parents. Mm. And I, I was. On the, on the plane coming over, there was a woman's 
giving and had a really hard time to the hostesses, the stewardesses on, on the plane saying, these planes don't have enough room and blah, blah, blah. And then she said, it's time we stood up and actually expressed ourselves instead of just taking it. And that was the key for me. It's, it's kind of fits in with this, that the more we can educate and encourage our patients to actually not be scared to say to their medical practitioner, their conventional medical practitioner, I use homeopathy. Because a lot of them are scared to say that. So it's about education, information, yeah. sharing that, giving confidence, inspiring parents to be able to have a voice and not to be afraid of Big Pharma or the big GP that tells them they're their idea that can't possibly afford it. Yeah. Thank you. I'm also looking at the reason why people are crying. Why are people so scared about talking about something which is natural, which is benefiting people? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's the fear factor around, around healthcare. Thank you. I was just going to continue with the thought of not just fear of the government or fear of big pharma, it's fear of those who are do not believe in home health. Yes. That's, that's probably bigger than anything else. The government and big pharma are just hopping in on that. Mm -hmm. It's all really their opposition. Yeah. And we'll look at ways and what we might do in terms of that. I, I see more, and maybe this is more in the U.S., of people not necessarily acting from fear, but acting from wanting things quickly and not taking responsibility for much of anything. So it's the need there is for people to start taking responsibility for their own environment and health. I couldn't agree more. Certainly in the UK at the onset of the National Health Service, which was about 60 years ago now, suddenly people started to de delegate their health to the GP. He was the man that was exactly the woman. It's so difficult for the average ordinary person to do anything about that when they're bombarded on an hourly basis yeah. by pharmaceutical advertising. And not only that, we've lost that... Um, the, the, the influence of generations of using herbs and potions from the garden and knowing what poultices to make and what to boil up for certain things. Certainly in the UK we had, had but we're seeing an uprising in, in utilisation of herbs and other things as well. And it's about education again, um, I think. And regaining our trust in our own body to heal. Yeah. And so I don't know how we summarise that, but um, that's the key doing really well there, thank you. What was coming, just from writing them, what was coming to mind was um, a lot of people <coughs> being disempowered. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I think growing your own food is a really important part of that. Definitely. Yes. Well, it's, it's really interesting because I'm going to say something that's opposite yeah. to yeah. the sort of sentiment and feeling that I get here, mm. coming from Bali, is that it's the opposite here. <laughs> we there's a lack of home, there's a lack of homeopaths, there's a lack of qualified people, and people here, like in the Solomons, really want it. Mm. You know, it's, it's interesting. And on one side of the world, we've got this sort of pressure and mm. and, and squashing Just out of suppress it. Mm. Here, the demand is much higher than the supply. So what are so, you what are you going to do about that? Uh, <laughs> help, help, okay. Help. Good. Yeah. Right. So actually, here's the question. <laughs> yeah. How many of you want to do a month or two at a time here in Bali? Is <laughs> reading people. <laughs> 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 one, two, look at this. Yeah. Have you got the box with the numbers? <laughs> <laughs> Now there's an idea, and oh, weren't we just sorry. discussing that earlier in terms of the homeopathic first aid kit, you know, at another level, should it be numbered? Dr. Syria was suggesting there should be immune A, immune B, and immune C, which is great for different diseases. Fantastic idea. Really good. And of course we've got Dennis here as well now. You're doing some fantastic work on the ground, homeopathic aren't you? Yeah. I think with the help of John Jenny. Yeah. Uh, well, it's always about the team. Yes, yeah, it's about the team. Yeah, but I, I've actually learned a lot since coming here seeing things that I've never, I've never seen in Australia. Mm. And um, uh, it's just been an eye opener for me as well. I mean, I've treated several cases of measles, which I've never seen. Well. Yeah. And they responded beautifully to the main impulsive to basically. Yeah. Great. But we've seen them with fever and things like that. I think we'd never end up at, at my peak 
unless they've been through the mill. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, uh, I don't know what we can do. I mean, you know, Ochotte has pointed out that there's a, there's a need for, I guess, more people on mm. the ground, but there are a lot of restrictions mm -hmm. for, for people like me or anyone who comes to work with us. So we need to educate the people. Yeah. yeah, that's the only right. solution. So, yeah. That is yeah. the only yeah. sustainable solution mm -hmm. on all fronts. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what you're trying to find is people. Yeah, yeah. We need to find the right people. Okay. Yeah, and educate them, and, and exactly, you know, very similar to the setup to what Jane's already doing. Mm -hmm. What's been done in the Solomons? Yeah. yeah. Well, we could have home home run arms here. Sounds good. Yeah. Same numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyone else? There's a documentary filmmaker here from France staying at Hotel Champlain. Oh, is <laughs> Yeah. He was, yeah. was he going to drop in? He, he was, was, but he didn't was. drop in. Doug is his name. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. I'd just like to make a comment that um, my, it, it seems that the developing countries are more, much more open, maybe because of the need. Yeah. Um, and, and that this, there's a movement of using homeopathy in our case, but traditional therapies more from Western countries who seems to, to seem to have been um, completely become entrenched in Western medicine. And, um, and the countries like China, you know, that's where Luc de Matonier, the, Matonier, the um, Nobel yes. Prize winner for the, the AIDS virus, um, Dared to mention at a homeopathic or at a science convention um, that homeopathy, you know, was deserving of more study. Mm. And you know, the, the the article I read said that you know that the delegates left the conference shaking their heads in wonderment. You know, so there's just absolutely, you know, in that environment, no nowhere to go. Mm. But in um, Malaysia, uh, is Siri still here? Okay. Uh, Malaysia and um, to some extent in, in Indonesia there seems to be a, mm. a double thing going on um, where this the health department is supporting it in homeopathy and I'm not yeah. quite sure. Hospital in, um, teaching university hospital in Malaysia. Yeah. yeah, there are a few actually. Yeah. So anyway, so it's like there's, it's, there's more freedom in, in, in developing countries than there is in, in our countries. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it's very people are pragmatic here. If it works, mm -hmm. they use it. If it doesn't work and it makes them sicker, they don't use it. No. There's none of this intellectualization of things. And so you treat a farmer for diabetes and he gets better, he comes back and sends his whole family rather than going to a hospital and, and, and having to fork out all the money on drugs. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's a financial issue <coughs> from the perspective of the of in Australia in particular, we have our our, um, uh, our national health system, our Medicare system that's sort of funded by the government, our PBS is funded by the government and that sort of suits the the uh, um, the dominant paradigm, I guess, but here in Bali and uh, um, Solomon's, they don't have a safety net. So people are really on their own. They can't afford the drugs that we are actually given uh, um, by our governments. Yeah. And there seems to be a, a, a yeah, I guess it's a, it's a dominant paradigm where that, where the, the whole system of, of Orthodox medicine is entrenched in the in the way government is run and the way health policy is pursued, um, and that's sort of I guess funded by the the social you know, the, yeah. the um, infrastructure like our, our social infrastructure here in Bali or here in Indonesia. This the social infrastructure doesn't sort of extend like it does in first world countries, and I don't think the money's here for the with a big, big yeah. So you're actually better off here in so Indonesia and Bali because you're not going to be forced to buy drugs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why I witnessed in India, I did six, eight weeks in the slums of Calcutta and in the hospitals alongside yeah. homeopathic doctors. And I saw all kinds of diseases being treated that just really opened my eyes. I took eight colleagues from our college as a post, uh, for a postgraduate course. 
And I just thought, wow, you know, at this level, and access to x-rays, to blood tests, treating everything from tumours to excellence to um, heart conditions. And everybody wanted homeopathy, even if they could afford them at Western Medical Drugs. And of course, with the, the size of the population in India, yes, it's homeopathy is the, second, the world's second largest, um, most widely used medicine. Yes. Uh, but people wanted it because it works. And they were walking miles, days to the slum clinics in order to be treated because they knew it worked and it would help them. Despite poor diet, despite malnutrition, they still were better off with homeopathic medicine than not having it. And of course, if you can find a way to improve the nutritional base, it's then going to have an even greater effect. In New Zealand, um, 12 up to 12, you can get free medical care. And one of the barriers, I think, in New Zealand homeopathy is that you actually have to pay good for homeopaths, mm. and the poorest people can't afford that. Yeah. Mm. And so homeopaths end up working for free. To, um, to do what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know the way around that, how to get that funding out there to people that actually want homeopathy. Well, we had a collective in um, South Wales where we did a low cost clinic in, well, in Ross on Wine in Monmouth on a Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, and people came for a very low fee, like £10. Um, but often, if they could, they would bring preserves, vegetables, firewood, anything else, and there was kind of an exchange system going on, and that felt appropriate. Yeah. But it meant people did have access, and the work got down, the it was available, <coughs> and we all gave our time free. We had enough work, you know, paying patients to be able to do that. Uh, I'm not saying that's viable for everybody, but it's a possible, a possible thing. Do you want to summarize by going through that? Um, yes, I guess I should. So I shall summarize. In two ways, I shall summarise this, and I shall summarise something I prepared earlier, as every good group leader presenter, you don't have group leader in Australia, <laughs> and in Indonesia, probably not, but that was the job I wanted. And as a child, I wanted to be a group leader presenter, to travel the world, to jump out of airplanes, interview people, animals, dogs, a lot. And look what I ended up doing. Hey, I love this equally as much. We'll give you a badge. <laughs> So let me come and read the board because I need my glasses and we'll, we'll see how all this links up. So yeah, some of the barriers. Um, okay. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, um, I've just got benefit. Uh, so it was global challenges. It was global challenges in healthcare. What are the challenges? Benefit, benefit our local communities. Yeah. Uh, protecting freedom of choice in healthcare. Yeah. Uh, protect integrity of... What was that? Food. 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 food and food production. Food. Yeah. 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 Which we've got here is food quality and distribution. These are yeah, some things I've prepared earlier. Um, and there are large displaced populations needing care. Yeah. And for all sorts of reasons, like um, you know, natural disasters and all the um, you know, political yeah. and, and migration and yeah. immigrants. Yeah. Um, homeopathy needs a united voice. Boy, there's a melting pot in there. Yeah. <laughs> Encourage, people need encouragement to speak out. They tend to be frightened. Um, ed education, information, give confidence to people, um, both in Western countries and developing countries. Um, what reason for fear about using natural therapies? This. Yeah. yeah, we need to overcome that through education. And one of the other things we did in Monmouth, we badgered the heads of the local schools repeatedly that um, girls, <laughs> repeatedly, um, I'm fairly persistent if you, you know, haven't got that message about certain things. And uh, a colleague and I, Brian, um, decided that she had her girls who had to be born in school because of the long distance to high school. And um, the healthcare, there was a matron there. And she'd just routinely administer Panadol for pain relief for menstrual things and for headaches and everything else. And there was no choice. And we eventually persuaded the head mistress of the Monmouth Girls' School to allow us to give a presentation to the 800 girls on homeopathic medicine at one of their assemblies. And um, they then sent out letters to get approval from the parents that if their daughter wanted to seek um, homeopathic support, that would be all right. It had to be recorded and on file that the parents had been informed. 
Um, we had offered to do this on a Thursday afternoon once a month. We ended up there and there was conflict with the free clinic that we were supposed to be running as well. Um, weekly for a whole day um, because there were always exam pressures, peer group bullying, um, stomach upsets, uh, where the food there was very good, we got invited to lunch a few times. Uh, but these girls then recognised and were able to take responsibility for their own health and that's something that's been coming out. You know, it is about wising up and teaching people that we don't have to be spoon-fed, that actually we do have a choice and we need to fight for that choice and have a voice in, in, in the healthcare that, that we're providing with. Um, yeah. Take care of more environmental health and health issues. Mm -hmm. Utilize more traditional health therapies. Yeah. Bali needs help. Um, developing countries um, more interested. Oh, developing countries are more interested mm. in homeopathy and can. There's less restriction. There's less barriers to entry. Often, I find in, in the third world countries. And they have more need, and there's no safety net. There's mm. nothing else for them. Yeah. Um, serious diseases um, sleep um, being treated in the slums of Kilcarra, mm -hmm. the homeopathy. And the last one is people can't, in um, New Zealand and in Australia, people can't afford homeopathy. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to copy these or camera them and we'll get that written up and included as part of the presentation notes because of things we can go away and think about. We may or may not have time this afternoon to, to build a full plan, but. You can see here that some of the other major things are the increases in epidemics. That hasn't come up, but surely, to goodness, there is an opportunity with Helio prophylaxis to help in these situations. And we've seen Isaac Golden's work and others and the work that we did in Solomon's with Dengue. And now we've got MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory um, Syndrome threat. And again, it's the way that that is um, promoted is that enough people are going to get frightened about getting it but not well. Oh, we've lost our slide. Yeah. Yes. I'm just finished. <coughs> I haven't finished. You got more slides? I've got two or three more slides. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm finished. I'm <laughs> sorry. Can we, just can, can we just go back? Can we just go back? And can you make it bigger? Because the writing is really sorry. small. Sorry. <laughs> Cut off in my car. <laughs> I've got five minutes, I need to watch. Well, two minutes. It's, it's yeah. a couple of minutes. Okay, so if we can click again. I haven't got anywhere else. I've got to go, so it's okay. You haven't. Has anyone else got anywhere to go? No. Okay. okay. Um, so this was a slide that I'm not going to great depth and detail, but this is um, from the World Health Organization um, website, and looking at the public health challenges for the next 35 years. Oh, you might be... So this is a slide from the World Health Organization of some of the major health challenges um, for the next 35 years. Um, and I see that within each of these categories there is potential and opportunity for homeopathy, whether it's in primary health care, looking at issues of, of inequality. And one of the things that really came out from the G20 Global Health Forums was creating an equitable health healthcare system so that everybody irrespective of age, income, location, has the possibility of accessing the medicines that they need. Um, one more slide. And I think then that's, yeah. And so this is, yeah, another summary. But very little is, is spent on disease pre prevention. And we know with homeopathy, if we're treating at a constitutional level, we're reducing susceptibility, inherited disease patterns, there's an awful lot that we can do to improve people's health moving forward. Um, and I can talk more about that at, at dinner. Is there one more? Um, yeah. So this was a summary, um, and if you like, a, a, a take home from the Solomons, in terms of, well, what, what do we see our role there, and what do we see our role moving forward? One of the most important things for me is the provision of cost-effective, self-sustainable health care. This is what every government is looking for. If you look at the Swiss uh, research, they found health, uh, homeopathy was extremely cost-effective, um, as in Germany, as in France, as it is in India. 
So why can't we make, a, you know, make that provision on, on a wider basis? And for me, it's about treatment, prevention, education, and keeping it simple, training people in the field, whether it's dispensers or whether it's local community midwives and health workers, and getting out there to, the, to our communities that, that need to receive this. Um, and I think there might be one more slide. I'm awfully sorry about that. <laughs> So this is the summary of the lessons. We don't need to go into great depth and detail. You've got that on a handout. But under those headings of treatment, prevention, education, simplicity, training, and outreach, that matrix, if you like, I believe, is a bit of a take-home for you. It's very simple, but you can apply that to any situation, whether it's Bali or whether it's anywhere else, and find the solutions within that. Or have, a, if you like, a template that you can use on which to build a more formalized plan of action. And I think the next one is a call to action. We haven't got time to do that collectively, but I ask you to go away and give some thought to what you can do differently as a result of today. We know small changes, one drop, can make a, a big change in, in um, our own lives, but more importantly, as a global um, collective of homeopaths, we can raise the level of consciousness, we can raise the level of education, um, and we can create a much healthier environment despite the destruction that's going on with our food, with the vaccinations, with the electromagnetic um, pollution and things as well. And I have one last quote. I was going to use Hahnemann's um, epitaph. Does anybody know that? There are two treasures in life. The first is, good, uh, is a clear conscience, and the second is good health. And, those two, and the two treasures, the first, the clear conscience is, is received, no, the good health is received through homeopathy, and the good conscience through our, our faith in God. And certainly the Solomon Islands project is a, a tribute to that of those missionaries that went to these far from places of the earth with their medicines and their Bibles. And the World Health Organization has used this description of um, health and disease since 1948. So there is a recognition that it isn't just about uh, physical symptoms, it is about mental and about community. And as a homeopathic community, again, I, I just feel that we have such a wonderful opportunity um, to take our message far and wide, to preach and heal the gospel of homeopathy, if you like, moving forward as medicine, yes, from the past, but very much medicine for the future. And this is the very final slide. Margaret Chan has been reappointed Director General of the World Health Organization for second term of office, and, and she wants to see a much more equitable playing field for healthcare, which is, I think, what all of us would like to, to achieve, and to look at the root causes of health and inequities. And isn't that what we do as homeopaths? We get right in there, and we look at the never well been, you know, never been well since. We look at the potential of vaccine damage and of other um, obstacles to cure, which we're going to hear more about this week from, from other speakers. So that's it. I hope I haven't overrun too much. Thank you for listening.